Yes. All right, we're going to be in, um, I think I'm just going to read out of the King James. We're going to be in Psalm, uh, Psalm chapter 34, and uh, we'll read verses uh, 1 through 10, and then we'll flip backwards to Psalm 22. <clears throat> and would you do me a favor whenever we put uh, passages of Scripture up there, unless we move forward, you just kind of like leave them up there so we can look at them and ponder them for a moment. But uh, before I read this, yeah, so just to let you know, the title of my message um, tonight is The Fruit is on Your Lips. Uh, really, Wednesday, sorry, Thursday morning after John had preached, uh, I woke up in the morning and the Lord put on my heart to preach about the, wor the words that we speak. Amen. And it wasn't directly related to his message because the Lord started downloading things like James and various things in my heart. But I remember that one of those comments that he made when he said about the little kids being vipers and diapers. And it's kind of like, I thought it was kind of funny just because it's talking about the sinful nature. And I mean, it's true. And it was just a funny way to say it. But I did call him up and I said, John, tell me you're not going to, that's not going to be your nickname for your baby. He said, no, dude, I'm like, oh, hallelujah. Uh, he said, you little viper, you know, like that. But uh, anyway, praise God. So, um, so that was, that was Thursday morning. The Lord put it on my heart to talk about this. And so that's the title. The fruit is on your lips. You know, before we get going real good, I do want to say that there's a lot of background information that I would say that connects to this truth. And part of a big part of it has to do with the concepts that we've kind of been spoke, speaking about for quite some time that the earth was created for man to inhabit and God gave man dominion and authority upon the earth. Amen. He even gave Adam the, the ability to name the animals and, and he gave, but I mean, even God in his, I mean, and I know God is God, but I'm just trying to make a point. He created through speaking the word. Amen. And he said, let there be light. And there was light. And, and I just want to say that I, as, as born again, believers becoming sons of God, that in Christ we have regained dominion and authority in the spiritual realm and I do believe that there is great power in our words now I've overcorrected um, because for various reasons like I feel as though sometimes emphasis seems like always the, the the enemy wants to come in and try to put people's emphasis in a place where it's not supposed to be right instead of our faith being squarely related to Christ and what he's done for us because it's the new covenant and that's where grace flows, something else always comes in. It's we, the next thing you know, we're putting our faith in our faith. We're putting our faith in our confession. Then we're putting our faith in people are putting their faith, could put their faith in deliverance. People put their faith in he like they become part of the prophetic thing. Everything wants to try to take the upper levels instead of Christ being exalted, Christ being magnified magnified and then everything else falling into the proper position that it has. But I just want to make it clear that I do believe that as sons of God born again in Christ and, the, and regaining the power and the authority that we were given in Christ, that our words do have meaning. <coughs> Amen. And I, I mean, I'm just going to be honest with you. Like, I know that I don't mean to be negative, but I know that in my own life growing up, that things that were said to me had an impact in my life in a negative fashion, right? And I do believe that that words of encouragement and strengthening and words that, you know, speaking the word of God in a situation, declaring the word of God, uh, you know, I believe it causes a shift. I believe that in the in the spiritual atmosphere, um, speaking forth the word of God and believing it. I believe that whenever we pray, amen, whenever we pray and, we, and we're connected to the Lord, I mean, what, what would be the reason to pray if we didn't believe that we were going to cause something to shift or we were going to cause something to move? And so, so when we pray and believe in God, I believe that something's shifting in the spirit realm and that God is moving uh, on behalf of his will and prayerfully we're praying according to the will of God. Amen. And so that's kind of like the idea of it. So let's go. We're going to start in Psalm 34 because one of the first things I want to show you is that with our lips, we should praise him. Amen. It says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. 
I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto him and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Amen. And so the first thing I want to talk to you about tonight is that with our mouth, we should praise him. We should declare his goodness. We should give him glory. Amen. And we should, we should give him honor, right? Okay. Let's take a look at Psalm chapter 22. Praise God that he's given us. There's power in our lips. Amen. There's power in our mouth. Waiting to be released and to shift things. I believe that. And even if the rest of the, if the whole church world believed that, if we believed as the children of God, uh, right, that, that it would make an impact if we really all would, would pray. And, and I'm talking about everybody across the globe. We, do you realize how powerful that would be? That if we would pray God's will and pray God's kingdom and his purposes Amen for this earth. I'm telling you right now, it would be, it would have a huge impact. I believe that. Praise God. All right. So look at Psalm 22. Now Psalm 22. I'm, I want you to look at these words. Now this is the psalmist, right? This is David, and he's writing the psalm, and it's, and it's a prophetic picture of the cross, right? So he is writing a thousand years before Jesus, and he is he is speaking, and 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 these words, our our Lord quoted. Much of these words. Okay, so you can see the Lord's declaring some things, right? And this is what he says. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but you hear us not. And in the night season and am not silent. That word crying, he's, he's crying out to God. He's putting words and words are coming, issuing forth from his mouth. He's, he's declaring and crying out to God. He says, but you are holy. You that inhabit the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted in you did deliver them. They cried unto you and they were delivered. They trusted in you and were not confounded. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him seeing he delighted in him. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. See, what I wanted you to see here is this, is that men have the authority to use their words and our words can bring life, but our words can also bring hurt and damage, right? And, and in this, what we're seeing is, is that Jesus is hanging on the cross because he says basically the same thing. And we're going to look at some of his words that he spoke while he was on the cross. And one of the things that really, really hit me today at another level is that they really wanted Jesus to fail. As you begin to see the things that people spoke to him, they wanted to see him fall. They wanted to see his demise, the very one that came to help them, the very one that clothed himself and tinted himself in human flesh so that he could die the death where he would take our condemnation and our guilt. These very people that even saw the miracles. Listen, we talked about it last week a little bit, but... but they, they, they were declaring something when he rode in on the donkey. They said, Hosanna, Hosanna to the king. And then, and then a week later, they were declaring something else. Crucify him. And something had shifted in a week's time. And they went from loving him and wanting him as long as they thought he was going to give them what they wanted. But then when he contradicted their own plans and their own will for, the, for their lives that they wanted, they didn't want to have anything to do with him. And they wanted to see him suffer. 
They spoke words that were cruel to him while he was hanging on the cross, while he was nailed there. And they just mocked him and they scoffed at him and they scorned him. And that's and listen, as we move through this message, I'm here to tell you that the writers of the letters prepare your heart as a believer to understand something. Prepare your heart as a believer that, that, these, that there's a concern that in the hearts of believers that there, there can be problems that, that, can, that, that can show forth in the words that we speak. In our heart. And, and, and they wouldn't have written it if it was impossible for believers to have these problems, right? Let's take a look at man without the help of the Holy Spirit, right? That's not you in here tonight, amen? Uh, but pray to God that we're all saved, that we all have the Holy Spirit living in us. But, but let's take a look at man, you know, without the help of the Holy Spirit. And you know what this is really trying to talk about? It should keep us sober-minded, my friend, to know that we didn't just wake up one morning and that all of a sudden, like, oh, we're running after God, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but the Lord pursued me. The Lord pursued me. He came and he found me and he moved upon me. And when he moved upon me, he gave me grace to respond to him. And something that I've learned is this, is that as he moved on me and as I moved on him, there is a truth that says that if we would draw near to the Lord, he would draw near unto us. But I can promise you that the Lord started it. Amen. He started this relationship. Praise God. And I'm so grateful that he did. But, but listen, there's people that don't have the Lord. Amen. Uh, and, and, and without God, this is what God says. If I didn't move on your heart, if I didn't, if I didn't initiate this, this romance, this relationship, we wouldn't even, we wouldn't even, we would never be able to be married. He says this, there's none that understand. There's none that seek after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There's none that does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues, they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Listen, two things I want to talk to you about. A sepulcher is another word for a tomb or a grave. He's saying, he's saying that a throat is like a grave. You remember whenever, and, and, and so I'm thinking that the, the mouth is kind of like the opening of the grave, right? And we're going to get into the heart in a moment, but there's sometimes there's death in people's hearts. And, and that grave, it's almost like, yeah, it's like the belch of death coming out of their throat. <laughs> whenever, whenever Jesus said, roll away the tomb, what did they expect to come belching out of that tomb? Lord, by now he's been in there four days, surely it stinketh. But what really came out was life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But at the same time, I want you to know that the word of God says that in man and left without the presence of the Holy Spirit, his throat is a sepulcher, a tomb, and that whenever it's belched out, it's belching out the stench of death. And that in their lips, in their tongue, it's like a viper. It's got the poison of an asp, a venomous snake. And listen, whenever a snake bites you, my friend, that kind of snake, it puts poison in you. It will put poison in you and it will begin to spread and it causes death. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be that. I don't want to be that. This is supposed to be people that are unredeemed. This is supposed to be people that do not have a relationship with the Lord and are not born again and don't have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of them. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. I looked up that word bitterness. And I, I, I'm always thankful for my mom. I know I've said that to y'all before. Because she always used to walk around the house using big words. And she'd have a crossword puzzle. So if y'all got a problem with my words, blame it on great mom. <laughs> but, but one of the words that described bitterness right there was acridity or acrid. A-C-R-I-D. It's not a word that's used very commonly. But I remember hearing that word. And you ever, this is probably the best way I know how to describe it. Is that you ever had, like, if, you, if you've eaten and your food didn't digest right, then all of a sudden it came up in the back and it's like, might smell bad, feels bad, tastes like, whoa, is that? Has that ever happened to you? Okay, y'all know what I'm talking about? That's acrid. It's a bad smell, bad taste, it's bitter, right? And, 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 and what the scripture is telling us is that people's mouths, sometimes instead of speaking blessings or speaking curses, 
and, and, that, and that what's coming out of them is bitter and that it has a bad taste. And if it has a bad taste, it, it, the, the Lord's saying that it's, it's a bad taste in his mouth. The Lord doesn't, doesn't like it whenever, whenever this is the thing that's coming out of human mouths. And, 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 I just, and I put in here, I put, how do I go from one who speaks curses to one who speaks blessings? Amen. And, and the first thing I put is confess Jesus. Right? And, and, and most people in here would say, well, praise the Lord. I've done that. Amen. I've confessed Jesus. If you confess Jesus then that, and you meant it, then that means that you're born again. Praise God. Well, the second thing that I would tell you is this. Evaluate yourself in relation to the word. And I'm going to say this. Don't evaluate yourself in relation to other people. Evaluate yourself in relation to the word. Yes, yes. Amen. We used to preach that a lot, right? Relative righteousness. It's been years since we really talked about that. But sometimes we will look at us and where we are with the Lord. And then we'll compare that to someone else. I used to preach this all the time. I used to say, because when the Lord first hit me with it, I was like, oh my gosh. Like, how much do we think that we're something and we've arrived? And I used to say, you know, here I am. I got two hands in the air. And look at you. You only got one. Or, you know, I, oh, I done made it to the altar and I'm on my knees and look at you. You're sitting down. You see what I'm trying to say? And, and, and we're, we're judging our walk with God and, the, and we're making the plumb line us versus someone else. But the plumb line, the measuring stick is Jesus. Yes, yes. The measuring stick is the word of God. It's 2 Corinthians 13 and 5 in the Amplified Version. I like the way the Amplified Version said it. It's kind of more like a commentary. I'll be real with you so you can go look it up in your own Bible later. But 2 Corinthians 13, 5 because we're talking about... We're talking about... Um, Examining ourselves. Look what it says. Examine and test and evaluate your own selves to see whether you are holding to your faith and showing the proper fruits of it. Test and prove yourselves, not Christ. Do you not yourselves realize and know thoroughly by an ever increasing experience that Jesus Christ is in you unless you are counterfeits disapproved on trial and rejected. Let's just go ahead and take a look at a literal translation so we can make sure that we're not just kind of like, you know, just throwing anything out there. Let's read. Let's go ahead and go to the King James Version because, you know, we, we all grew up on that. We like that. Second Corinthians 13 and 5. Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know you not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. Now, why would the Apostle Paul write this to a church if there wasn't the danger that people sitting in churches could be counterfeit, could be reprobates, could be going through the motions? And I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but I think that it's very important for a pastor that is going to be responsible for every word that he yeah. speaks when he stands behind the sacred desk yeah. to at least try to encourage people to say, hey, examine yourself. Yeah. Examine yeah. your own heart like the psalmist said. Search my heart, Lord. Try my reins. See if there be any wicked thing in me. I come to you, O oh Lord. I bow before you. I thank you for Calvary. You've done everything that anybody could have ever asked. You've proven your love to me, Lord. And I just want to know that I'm okay. I don't think that there's something wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. That is the word of God. God's God wants his people to walk in purity and holiness. Right. He wants our hearts to be connected to his heart. Listen to me. Boy, it would have been one thing if you was living in the Old Testament, my friend. But look, you're not living in the Old Testament. You're living in the New Testament. And, and you've been given access to grace. Yes. And not just to be forgiven, but to walk right. Yes. To talk right. To live right. Yes. Amen. We will be without excuse. And praise God for justification. I'm about to get into some of that in a second. But praise God, I, uh, you know, confess Jesus. Evaluate yourself in relation to the word. Confessing Jesus is like the planting of the seed. Amen? We talked about that. 
Sunday, right? The word of God goes forth. It's like a seed. It's planted in the heart. And then now that Jesus tree starts to grow. Amen. That Jesus tree starts to grow. I was telling them guys at the jail today. I'm like, man, I don't know much about gardening, but I remember one time I went to my grandpa's house and, I, and he was growing some tomato plants. And I'm like, what's that piece of metal you got on there? I got to protect this thing, son. I got to make sure this thing grows straight. Stuff doesn't get to it. Listen, you got to protect the seed of the gospel. The, the, everything in the world, the flesh, the devil is trying to destroy the seed of the gospel in you. That's the most precious thing that this earth has ever held. Yes. Oh, thank you, Jesus. But in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, it says that if you confess with your mouth, I want this word confession for a moment. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. I personally believe that confession and heart are the operative word right there. Like, that, in other words, the pivot point, the hinge. The hinge of the scripture is, is located in, in confession, but really the heart. Because, see, you can, you can believe something in your head. And I know I say that a lot, but I don't know if we say it too much because I think it's important. You can believe something in your head. And I think I even quoted something last It wasn't in my notes, but I think I said something about and it was when my sister Debbie, one of the first scriptures she ever told me, you say there's one God, you believe there's one God, you do well. But the devil's also believing they tremble. And I remember, I was like, ooh, you know, I didn't know what to do with that. But you know what? Sometimes we, we need to be shaken up a little bit. See, that's the devil's believe cognitively, intellectually that Jesus it is the son of the living God. They believed it. They said, son, Jesus of Nazareth, what have you you've come before the appointed time to torture us? They knew who he was. But they can't believe with their heart. They can't be saved. See, and so whenever we believe with our heart and confess with our mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord, that God raised him from the dead, then we shall be saved. Look at, look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. <laughs> it says this. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, John wrote in this letter, he says, I say these things to you so that no man may sin. But if any man does sin, let him know that he has an advocate with the father of the Lord Jesus Christ. In order to get into the kingdom, you have to confess your sin. You have to repent. But as you walk closely with the Lord and you realize through the fruit of your life as you examine yourself and you realize your life is not lining up, not with what Pastor Matt says unless it's coming out of this book, but if it's coming out of here in the word of God and your own life is not lining up with the book, then, when you're, then what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to confess our sin. We're supposed to lower ourselves in the presence of God and we're supposed to get, get do business with the Lord. Is, it, is that fair to say that? Like, Lord, I need you. I thank you. I thank you for your goodness, for your grace and your mercy. I want to be right with you. I want my heart to be right with you. Amen. Praise God. And so in our little, uh, of course, I don't have my, I don't know, they said something about my chalk. Where's my chalk? Bro? That's on the desk. Oh, okay. I'm going to get my chalk. See y'all in a second, okay? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> all right, we got all kind of chalk, man. Thank you, Lord. All right, here's the chalk. Okay, so. We know we did this in our Bible study. We had a few visitors in our Bible study. That was pretty fun, right? And, and it looked like it kind of, it, it made a hit. It looked like Brendan liked it. So I figured I'd throw it in here again. But the word confession, because see, we're talking about, we're talking about our, the declaration of our mouth. The title of the message is, the fruit is on your lips. It's supposed to be kind of like a play on words, you know, in the garden, but then also the fruit on your lips, what you speak, right? And so... That word for confession in the Greek language, that's an English word translated from a Greek word, okay? And I did this at the jail today, too. I had my little marker. So this is the first part of the compound word of confession in the Greek. Now, how would you say that word right there? Most people would say homo, right? Because that's how we're used to recognizing it. And that's why I wanted to leave that up there for a second. I say the, when you're pronouncing it in the Greek language, it's homo, but that's what it means. It's, it's homo, okay? And so the second part of the word is this. So it's a compound word. It's one word. 
Ulagia, Hamalagia. Okay? So if you split it out right here, then what you have is you have say, say. So it's a so the most literal translation that you could really do here is you could create a new word and you could say same say. Okay? Same say. And, and if we were going to really break it down to where it's actually English, then we would say, say the same thing. Say the same thing as what? Say the same thing as God's word. Amen. Line up with God according to his word, what he says. Amen. Confess your sin. If we say that we don't have sin, then we are a liar is what he said. And listen, and that's in the beginning. Yes, um, because there's many human beings that are unwilling to recognize that they have sin and they reject Christ. But even after we're living with the Lord, if we realize that out of us is coming things that are unrighteous, it's not a, it's not a bad thing to humble ourselves before the king. Yes, yes. I mean, does that make sense? To humble ourselves in his presence. Amen. All right. So let's take a look at a couple of scripture because I want to build a foundation for in a moment. So in Romans chapter four, verse three, it says this. What says the scripture? Abraham believed God. I think I'm in the ESV. I don't know. But anyway. For what says the scripture? Abraham believed God. And it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Right? He believed. And he was given righteousness. And I wanted to just say this. We are supposed to confess what we believe. Amen? Amen? There's a confession that's because it says in Romans 10, 10 it says, and you don't have to turn there if you don't want, but it says for with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. All right. So, so Abraham believed. Amen. And then, but I want you to see something. Look at uh, Romans chapter, chapter four, verse five. It says right there that. Abraham believed in, and I mean, I, I'm paraphrasing, but Abraham believed in the God that is that justifies. He justified, right? That's the King James Version. Amen. How, how does it word it exactly? It says, but to him that works not, but believes on him that justified the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now, real quick, Romans chapter six, verse 11 I want you to see, I want you to see one more thing. It says, now reckon yourselves therefore to be dead. Right? Is that what it says? Let's see. Dead to sin. Reckon yourselves therefore to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, what I want you to understand is this, is that God says, I'm, I'm building something here. See, God declares something about your life. And what God is declaring about your life is this, is that when you believed in Christ, the Bible teaches, and I know y'all seen these stick men before. I'm not going to draw the whole thing. I'm just going to draw your position in Jesus, okay? The Bible says that whenever you put faith in Christ, your old man that was born of Adam, this is Romans 6 and Galatians 2, your old man that was born of Adam was placed or baptized into Christ Jesus, and in God's mind, you died with him. You were buried with him. And a new man was resurrected to newness of life. All that is said in Romans 6. And then Galatians 2, 20 is real fast. I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but he liveth in me. And now this life I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. So we're living sacrifices. Amen. And so this is our position this is, this is what you call your position. Meaning, what does that mean? It means in God's mind, you are in Christ. And Christ is in you. And even the scripture says in Ephesians that you're seated with him in heavenly places. I mean, that's beautiful. I mean, we got, that, there you go with that power and authority and dominion. Amen. To believe. Amen. For, for, for merit, you know, you get it. Okay. And so, so here you are, but then God, so now listen, 
<laughs> these are some funny looking eyes, but these are the eyes of God. We used to draw this all the time. So now when God is looking at you, if you're born again, he doesn't see you. He sees Christ, his beloved. You're clothed in his righteousness. Amen. That's a, that's a really good deal, my friend, because we're not getting in on our righteousnesses. It's his righteousness and the giving of it as a gift and the way that he, you know, gifts, gifts are free to the recipient, but they always cost somebody something. Romans 5 and 17 says that you've been given a gift. The gift is righteousness, but it costs Jesus everything. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God the Father gave a gift, but Jesus gave a gift. Jesus' gift was his life, his righteous life, where he laid it down on the cross. And, and then you, when you put faith in that, you were clothed in him, Galatians 3 and 27. Those who have been baptized into Christ have put him on. You've clothed yourself with Christ Jesus. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Okay. Now, I'm not good at mouths, but I'm just going to say, because I don't want to mess up God's mouth, but look, it's just a mouth, okay? All right, and so what I'm trying to say is this. That's, that's one of the cartoon things, right? <laughs> justify. That's what the word justify means. It's a declaration by God. See, the devil wants to convince you that you're not justified. But the devil's a liar. That's right. And he wants to take every time you mess up and he wants to convince you that you're not really righteous in the eyes of God. And I'm here to tell you that we're either in or we're out. Yes. You, you understand what I'm trying to say? But for a period of time, and I'm, I don't know that I'm going to run over there and grab one, but for a period of time, about two years ago, the Lord started dealing with my heart. And he started saying, son, I'm concerned. I feel like you're using justification like a blanket. You're hiding under it. And you're not really searching your heart. And, and you're like, and you're getting comfy. And you're saying you have struggles. But I feel like you're kind of snuggling your struggle. And, and it's not really working for me. Because see, I paid a high price so you could be free. Yes, yes. Amen. Yes. And because of your justification, there's grace flowing in your life. And the grace will set you free. But the reality of it is, is that you need to die to yourself. You need to go back to the basics. You need to die to your flesh and the desires and your own wants. Amen. And you need to let me have my way because I purchased you. I, pur I purchased you with my son's blood. You don't belong to yourself. You are not your own. And you were bought with a price. And now you belong to me, son. And I need you to give yourself to me. And this is part of the process of dying to self. If we're going to flesh this thing out... But like, what does that even mean? How do I die to myself? Okay, if we're going to make it real, when, when we examine ourselves according to the word and our life isn't lining up, let's start, let's start with Pastor Matt. Come on, Pastor Matt. You know you got some stuff in your life that you need to let the Lord kill. Start with me. As a matter of fact, let's just act like the whole thing's about me tonight, okay? Let's start with Pastor Matt. You, whenever Pastor Matt looks at the word of God, he's like, ooh, ooh. Okay, well, what are you going to do? I'm going to get in the presence of the Lord and I'm going to bear my heart out to him. And trust me, this is a daily thing for me. Where I, because see, it's kind of like Isaiah with me. Now, I'm not trying to say I'm seeing what Isaiah saw. I'm just trying to say when I feel the presence of the Lord, when it's me and him, that's how I feel. Now, now don't get me wrong. I walk out of here feeling cleansed, my friend. I walk out of here with pep in my step. I walk out of here full of the joy of the Lord. I walk out of here, you know, hey, look, I'm excited about Jesus. I mean, praise God, I get opportunity to talk to people about Jesus all the time. And Well, I'm just going to leave it like that. And I'm excited about what he's done in my life. Praise God. But I wanted you to see we've got to believe the same thing that God believes about us. Reckon yourself, therefore, to be dead. We've got to say the same thing God says about us. I want you to know you're a, you're a new creation. Amen. In Christ Jesus. Praise God. That's good, huh? What a miracle. Have you felt that yet? Because listen, oh, yeah. if you're walking around under a condemnation and guilt, something's not right. I want you to know that. Right. And listen, I don't know that you'll get the revelation today. I believe that the Holy Spirit can reveal it to our hearts. 
Holy Spirit, we need you. We need you to reveal this to our hearts. But it, it has to be a revelation from the Holy Spirit. But it's a revelation of his word. And it's, and it's in his word. Because, see, it's not God's will that we walk around under a cloud of condemnation and guilt. That's not God's will. God's will is that we walk in freedom and liberty where the spirit of the Lord is. There is liberty. Yeah. He's, he's done the work. You're free. We're free. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen. Do you believe that? Yeah. But, but, amen. Hallelujah. It's so good. But I don't feel it. Okay. Well, you're not going to go by your feelings because that's your soul. Oh, we ain't got time to break this down. But look, that's your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions. Your emotions are what you feel. You can't come up in here. I don't feel like worshiping the Lord. You got to let your soul dictate to you, to your spirit, what your spirit knows Jesus deserves. Now, come on. No, your spirit is that eternal part of you that's come alive to God when you got saved. That's what Ezekiel the prophet said. He said, I'm going to put a new spirit in you and I'm going to renew your spirit. I'm going to put my spirit on the inside of you. Hallelujah. Amen. You're a spiritual creation. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. And God's alive in you. Don't let your, don't let your soulish self, your own mind, what you think, your own will, what you want, and your own emotions, how you feel, dictate. David said, why are you downcast, my soul? No, I'm going to worship the Lord because he's worthy. Amen. And a lot of times we'll just join in. Next thing you know, it's like, all right, now I feel something different. Hey, you see what I'm trying to get at? So it's really about what we believe. Yes. Amen. It's about what we believe. Right. And then we confess what we believe. All right. Believe about you what God believes about you. Confess about yourself what God says about you. But if your heart is not lining up with the mirror of the word, Confess your sins. Amen. Because he's faithful to forgive. All right. Now, according to the word, you're a believer, right? We went through all that and we all agree we're believers in this house. Praise God. I hope we are. Amen. Jesus said you will know them by their fruits. These are some of Jesus's words. You will know them by their fruits and out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now we're going to. Because we're talking about we're talking about words, and this is what the Lord gave me to preach the, the Thursday after John preached. I told you all that when I first started. He said, "I want you to preach on your words. There's power in your words." That's right. We will look at these passages in context, but let's just see what was in the abundance of Jesus's heart first. See, the Lord about two weeks ago started speaking to me. I'm telling you, man, God is so good. He's been speaking to me about the worship in the church, and also about my preaching. And I feel like I've been preaching the gospel, but I feel like he's taking me to another level. And what I feel like he's trying to tell me in my spirit, and it's been going on for about two and a half, three weeks, is the same thing that he's been telling me. But I don't know that it's been coming out, you know, what I'm getting at. I'm just telling you, dude, I'm constantly, not dude, you're not dude. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm telling you that the Lord has just been dealing with me. And I've been seeking God that he would deal with me, that I would properly that I would properly magnify, that the, that the Lamb would receive His glory and His honor from our worship and also from the preaching of the Word of God. That because, because Jesus is worthy, amen, to be exalted and magnified. Hallelujah. And amen. And, and, what, and, and so what He's been showing me is it, give, give Him Jesus. Give Him, give him His Give him what he's done. Give him his life. Give him his words. Let us, let us let Jesus be magnified. Let us expose him. And let us learn of him. And let us, let us become intimate with him. Let him grow in us. I've been, for about the last two months, I, I mean, it's just becoming more real. I've been talking about Christ being formed in us. The circumcision of our flesh getting rid of us so that Christ can be formed in us. John the Baptist, I must decrease. So we've been preaching that for years, but he's just bringing it to a whole other level in my heart. Like, he's worthy. He's worthy. Amen. He's worthy to receive glory and honor. Y'all know what I'm talking about. All right. So you can, one of the things I want to say is this is you can really learn a lot about a person whenever they're caught in a bad predicament. <laughs> you ever notice that? <laughs> Help us. You know, like about last last week, last week I did a little fast. And I prayed 
almost every day I was fasting, that the, that the Lord, okay, I'm going to tell you what I prayed. I said, Lord, Father. I said, Father, give me the heart of your son. And look, he did, I'm telling you, I didn't hear him speak to me, but it was like, it was like he reminded me. And what he reminded me of was about in 2002, 2003, I prayed that prayer. And I've told you all before that I prayed that prayer. But he reminded me. He didn't say it again. He just reminded me of that moment. And what he told me in 2002, 2003, when I prayed that prayer, he was like, do you remember what they did to him? Because, see, when we pray prayers like that, you, you know what I'm saying? And listen, let's face reality. We, our level of persecution in America, come on. No. You, you understand what I'm getting at? But, see, if we're going to have the heart of the Son, there's going to have to be some, some things that are going to have to take place in our heart. And, and in order for that to happen, a lot of times... There is, there is going to be painful circumstances and situations that are going to take place. And, and what ends up happening is the question is, how will we respond in those circumstances? Right? And I don't know about you. I mean, I sing this song sometimes. He's still working on me. I'm not using it as an excuse. Took him just a day to make the moon and the stars, Jupiter and Mars. But he's still working on me. Amen. I'm a work in progress. You're a work in progress. And one beautiful thing about the church of Jesus Christ, hallelujah, brothers and sisters in the Lord, is that we're long-suffering with one another. We prefer our brothers and sisters over ourselves because that's the heart of our master. Amen. He laid his life down. Jesus said, I could. Son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to lay his life down as a ransom for many and so that's what we do. We long suffer with one another. We pray for one another. We encourage one another. If we're the family of God, right? Amen. I believe that. That's the word of God. Yes, yes. So you learn a lot about a person whenever you see them in a situation, right? But let's take a look at Jesus. Lord, help me to get through this. I'm just going to kind of go quick. These are the seven statements of Jesus on the cross. Because you see, you can see in his heart. And we're not going to turn to him, but I just want to tell you. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I was really thinking about that and pondering that. It's like a lot of times whenever people do things to you or we do things to other people, we don't even really admit it. If we're going to be fair with one another, there's a lot of times that we don't even realize the effect that we're having. It's almost like if we're going to give somebody some credit here and believe that they're truly believers, right? A lot of times when we do things a certain way, we, we may not have even realized what we were doing. If we're going to give people grace. Amen. And, but, and, but I want you to know that this, you know, look, Jesus rebuked Peter on the day of Pentecost. I'm sorry, not on the day of Pentecost. But Jesus rebuked Peter before he even went to the cross, right? And said, get behind me, Satan. But look, Peter still after the day of Pentecost, look, after he preached the message, 3,000 people got saved. After he preached the message, 5,000 people got saved. After he walked to the gate beautiful and told the lame man, and he said, as silver and gold have I enough, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. Hallelujah. And he went leaping and dancing and praising God. Even after all that, Peter finds himself, according to the Apostle Paul, in Antioch, playing the hypocrite. Yes, yes. Causing division in the church. So much so that Barnabas, the son of consolation, was driven away with his hypocrisy. The Apostle Paul had to, had to call him out in public because he made a public discrediting because he used to eat with the uncircumcised but then when the brothers from James came he played the hypocrite yes, yes. that's Peter yes. that's Peter after Pentecost filled with the Holy Ghost healing people his shadow shake up on what kind of anointing is this his shadow healing people and look what he does it's in us it can still yes. be in us that's right Amen. Help us. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. Right? I think to myself, what had to happen in order for that statement to be said? 
something happened. There was a change, right? Yes. Isn't that what the word repentance means? A change of the mind? Yes, yes. I mean, I preach this, dude. I can tell you, that scene is beautiful. You sit there and you watch it. Here's Jesus hanging, and he's hanging naked on the cross, and the, and the world is like <laughs> wagging scissors with that wagging their head. Look at you. <laughs> I mean, dude, they had hate in their heart towards our Jesus. Look at you. Oh, big mouth. <laughs> what you going to do now, nail to that cross? You said you said you were going to rebuild the temple in three days. You can't. Come on now, big boy. Mocking him, laughing at him, scorning him. It says that in the beginning of the morning, the both of the thieves were saying the same thing. But at some point, time, yes, that other yes. thief had to change a heart. Oh, he saw something in Jesus. Yes. He saw the love. He saw the compassion. Yes. He saw the way that he that he, he had listened to these different words that he was saying. He saw what was coming out of Jesus at this worst moment. He he said, "Oh, let, let me have your kingdom." Hallelujah, you had to change your heart. Praise God. Oh, what, a, dude, what, a, what an opportunity to be crucified next to Jesus. Huh? Wow. Oh, man. Thank you, Jesus. How beautiful, right? Amen. Then, then he says, be, behold your son. Woman, behold your son. And then behold your mother. Jesus said this, they will know you by your love for one another. She's your mom and now, John. I'm going and where I'm going, you can't go, but you know where I'm going. Right? He told him that in John 14. But he said, this is to take care of him. Take care of him. She's your mom now. And take care of him. He's your son now. Mom, I'm going. I'm going home to the Father. And, and, and for you and I, we got to understand God wants his love. He wants Jesus' love to come out of us. Amen? He wants the real love of Christ yes, to be yes. formed in us and that we would learn that even in the bad times and the hard times that we would die to self and that Jesus would be yes. produced the fruit of the Spirit. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Lord. And he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I preached on that Sunday. So for Tom, I'm just going to, that's a good one. He was separated, because, not because of his own sin, but because of Matt's sin. Yes. But then this one hit me a little bit different. He said, I thirst. And as soon as I looked at that one last night when I was laying in the bed, I could hear the Holy Spirit saying, I thirsted for you. Will you thirst? Will you hunger and thirst for my righteousness that I paid for for you? I thirst it on the cross for you. And, and what I'm trying to say is this, is this. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And first, let us get a revelation of what true righteousness is. And it's Jesus and it's our new position in him. But now that righteousness is to be formed in us. Yes, yes. Amen. Amen. That grace. It is to form the righteousness of Christ in us. Thank you, Lord. Yes, yes, hallelujah. Man, he said it is finished. Boy, that's a whole mouthful right there, right? He completed the work. He sat down. Amen. Oh, the mother priest could never sit down because their work was never completed. Jesus sat down. It's a finished work. You got to learn how to believe in that and trust in that. He did it. It's done. The word of God says it's done. It's yours. You got you to believe it and you got to reach out and grab it. I don't know how else to say it. You got to reach out and grab it by faith, my friend. You need to get into the Word of God. You need to let the Word of God have its way in your heart. Yes. You need to reinculturate yourself. This world's trying to lie to you. Come on. All right. Come on. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And then he says this Into your hands I commit my spirit. You know the scripture that says he's the author and the finisher of our faith. And in that word, author, one of the meanings of that word is a pioneer. Can you imagine? Jesus, our pioneer. I think about that when I think of this. A pioneer that's traversing an area where nobody's ever been. He crossed over, man. He, he was the first one that crossed over for us. He crossed that spiritual Jordan. He, he said, my father has given me the ability to let, he said, no man takes my life. That's right. My father gave me the, I can lay it down, I can pick it back up. Again. Yes, yes. And, but he had to trust the Father. He said, into your hands I release my spirit. 
I don't know what you're going to face before you die, but I'm going to tell you something you can, you can trust. That, that, that your last breath is the greatest moment of your life. <laughs> you hear what I'm trying to tell you? Your last breath on earth, whenever that is, however it happens, I need you to believe this. It's going to be your best moment in life, man. You're crossing over the Jordan where your pioneer went before you and he paved the way. And you can believe that. Praise God. I want you to know, though, that Jesus goes on and he connects fruit to speech. Just like a tree brings forth fruit, a mouth brings forth the words. And sometimes the words reveal the tree. In, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 33, Jesus says this. Matthew 12 and 33. He says, either make the tree good. Now he's talking to the Pharisees. I had somebody approach me one time and say, yeah, but Jesus was talking to the Pharisees. And I'm like, and? <laughs> You think that the Pharisaical spirit is still not alive and well in the church today? You think that that spirit of religion is still not alive and well today in the hearts and lives of people? And we walk around and we think that, oh, that, he got that, she got that, that one got that. Well, sometimes maybe we might need to, again, take a look at our own selves because I'm not going to sit. I've been very transparent with this church, and I have admitted more than once that I have been under the control of a spirit of, spirit of religion before. We've, if we're honest with one another, we all at some point in time probably have when we were walking in that relative righteousness and comparing our walk with someone else's walk. Lord, help us. Yes, yes. But anyway, he says either make the tree good, its fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by its fruit. Oh, generation of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So now, boy, now we're getting somewhere with this. Because see, if the throat is a sepulcher and the opening up of the mouth is the rolling away of the stone of the tomb, the death is really coming from the heart. Whenever those, those words are coming forth, come on somebody, help me out here. Because I know I'm not the only one that's ever spoken words of death as a believer. And not in this house. I know that we've all done it. Yes. Okay. And whenever those words come forth like that, and it's the stench of death coming off of our lips, we need to take notice of that. Because see, what's happening when we hear those words and we realize the words that we say, do you, have you ever said anything that you regret about? Or oh, no. I mean, did that happen recently in your life? I don't know. I mean, I'm just asking. And if it did, how did you handle that? Did you contemplate that? Like, why do? Why does that come out of my mouth? Why? Why does that happen like that? I mean, because I do. I mean, I'm over here, like trying to look at my heart. Like, Lord, why? What's going on in here? You know? And, and and I think that we need to. So anyway, you get it. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. An evil man out of the tre evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Yeah. Wow. Wow. I mean, that's even worse. That, I mean, that's even more sobering for me. Amen. I'm just being real. Like it's coming really alive to me here lately. You are going to give an account, son. That's right. That's serious business. Y'all yeah, right. pray for me, please. Pray that I pray that the Lord's heart would be formed in me. That's what I need. Amen. I need the Lord's heart. I'm praying for myself. I don't want to do it wrong. What, you think on this stand before God, dude, I believe this thing's really going to happen. That's not, this ain't some play game for me. I am convinced that Jesus is real, and I'm convinced that I'm going to stand before him, and I'm convinced you're going to stand before him. Each and every one of us is going to stand before him, and I'm convinced that in some way, shape, or form, I'm going to be held accountable for the encounter that you have with Jesus on that day. Yes, yes. But look what he says, every idle word men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by your words, look at this, by your words you shall be justified, by your words you shall be condemned. Wow. This, this scripture came alive to me 
in a whole nother way today. Because look, I'm trying to tell you something. Jesus just said something. This is one of the problems that I think that we're having in the modern church. Number one, people aren't reading the word of God. We're not focused on the word of God. Number two, and I've been guilty of this. We read it, but we don't really believe it. Believe it to the point where we let, allow it to have its effect in our life. We're just like, oh man, I've been reading the word of God. And we just been become, we become recipients of what Isaiah's prophecy was. And Jesus quoted Isaiah's prophecy. What, what, what did he say? Jesus quoted Isaiah's prophecy. He said, speak forth the word of God until their hearts become fat. Yes, yes. Kids sit in churches in America and they've been hearing the word of God over and over and over again. And so much so that they form calluses on their heart. Their heart gets fat and the word of God's not penetrating their heart. What do we need to do? We need to pray for our children. We need to pray for our loved ones. We need to pray for our youth. Lord, shake us. We need to pray for ourselves that we wouldn't have heard the word of God so much that we've just gotten casual with it. Yes, yes. Lord, help us. But what I wanted you to say is that he's saying something here. He's saying, by your words, you will be justified. Well, what does that mean? Does that, I mean, no, no, Lord. That's, no. You said that if I put faith in, in your in what you did, that you would account it as righteousness for me, and that when that happened, that the Father declared that I'm justified. So it can't it can't be both. No, I think there's something going on here. Yes, yes. I think there's something going on here. And what's going on here is that sometimes if perpetually the words coming out of our mouth are not lining up with the word of God, then we have to question our hearts. Yes. We have to question our lives. Yes. We have to question what is going on. Why is what I'm speaking not lining up with the word of God? Yes. Somebody better. Somebody oh. needs to help me. Because yes. Jesus said it right here. Yes. He said you're going to be justified and condemned by your words. So what I'm trying to say is this, and we can close. I'll go ahead and get Rich to come up here. I had a lot more to give you, but we'll be thankful for people's time. What I'm trying to get at is this, is this, is that, man, God has done a great work. And the seed of the gospel has been planted in our hearts. But there's an ongoing work that's taking place in us. And it's at the end of 2 Corinthians 13, I believe, the last verse. It says, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you right now, Hallelujah. grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And look, this is the ESV version. It says, the communion of the Holy Spirit. King James Version says, I believe, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And the word in the Greek is koinonia. Y'all heard me talk about that word over the last two years so many times. And you know what the word koinonia means? Joint participation. You and I have to participate with the Holy Spirit as he's working in our heart and in our lives, as he's revealing truths to us. Listen, let's examine our hearts, amen, according to the word. And let's examine the fruit in our lives. And let's just do business with the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your work in our hearts and in our lives. We give you glory, Lord. We worship you. We thank you, O oh precious Lamb of God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. It's worship.